and welcome to another video. Thank you for joining me down here in the village of Drub, which is just between Birkenshaw and Cleckheaton, just outside Bradford in West Yorkshire. On what is an absolutely glorious Wednesday afternoon. It's really warm and really nice. But we're down here today to look at something a bit different. And it's something that I've known about for quite a while now and I've always wanted to cover it on the channel but I just wasn't quite sure how to go about it. So what I've done is I've done an awful lot of research and I'm going to tell you the story of what happened here on Boxing Day in 1943. And while we're here, we'll take a tour around and I'll show you some of the uh, sites that relate to the story as well. So what we're going to be looking at today is a, a Halifax bomber crash that happened right here on Boxing Day in 1943 and it happened on these fields here or just behind the camera just outside the village of Drub. Now the story is quite a fascinating remarkable story so I'm going to go through with you now the basic premise of what happened. So on Boxing Day 1943 a young pilot who was only 20 years old by the name of Tom Scotland he was flying his Halifax bomber aircraft on a training mission and he came all the way from Marston Moor Air Base which was just near York and he was flying around the area doing some uh, training exercises and his plane got into some trouble. It was basically the motor or the engine on the left wing burst into flames mid-flight and right there and then he had to make a quick decision as to what he was going to do. Now he did have seven other crew members on board the plane and he instructed them there and then to get out of the plane basically. So they parachuted out of the plane to safety. And then he had a, a decision to make as well. Right there and then, as he's circling around this area here, which is rather built up, he was panicking, wondering whether he should ditch the plane himself and jump out with the parachute like the other lads did, or whether he should stay with the plane and land it, avoiding the village and trying to kill other people in the houses. So he made a split decision within a couple of seconds there and then. Being a 20 year old lad as well, all that weight on his shoulders, he decided to stick with the plane and guide it hopefully to safety. And, but that could mean in his death himself. So he took that risk and what he did, he brought the plane in quite low around here and he was looking for a landing spot. Now, if you know this area, it's quite hilly and there's a big valley down here. So he didn't really have much choice. So what he did was he circled round just behind the camera and he managed to bring it in just at the bottom of the road down here behind the camera and run it up this hill where I'm sat now, knowing that the momentum of the hill would stop it. So he managed to bring the plane in just down the bottom end of this site. I'm just going to turn you around and show you now. So if you just take a look down there in the valley, so he managed to circle the plane down, round across Whitehall Road, which is just there, running behind them trees in the distance. He managed to circle it around there, and as he came in over the road, he managed to hit the wall at the edge of the road, the dry stone wall, and it tore off the tail of the plane, dispersing it down there, the bottom end of the site. And then he managed to bring the plane just up this valley here, in the next field there. And he managed to stop it just before it hit the village over there. So when the tail came off down there at the bottom, he then hit the ground straight away, skidded up the hill, came to a stop right at the top of the hill in some trees, which I'm presuming would be those trees down there. And then it avoided all the houses that were near it. There's housing all down the side of there. Just as he managed to clamber out of the plane from the top, he jumped down the side. It's about a 12 foot drop down the side. He managed to just jump out the plane just exploded and blew up. Now it did have ammunition on board the plane but no bombs or anything like that. Now when it, when it exploded and he jumped out of the plane he managed to clamber up the uh, banking away from the plane. And just as he was doing that a lot of the villagers were coming out rushing towards him. The first one that came up to him just as this had all happened was a young boy. And the young boy said to him, hey mister can I have your tail? <laughs> Obviously, at the time, he meant he wanted the tail down the bottom to keep. Now, being full of uh, 
heavy metal down there, it would have been a couple of tons in weight. But if you read uh, the book that Tom Scotland wrote about the story, he mentions that very uh, story there, that the young boy that came up to him. During the crash, Tom actually injured his back quite bad and he was able to move, but when he jumped out of the plane, he said it actually really hurt when he fell. Now, just another side story that's related to this. At the time, there was a five-year-old boy playing with his friends just on the old coal mine, which I'm presuming is the one on the hill just up here. Now, if you remember when I did the Emmett's Canal video, I was in this area then. The Emmett's Canal is just a couple of miles, well, it's not even that, it's a mile over there. So I'm very close to where I did the Emmett's Canal video. And the pit site is at the bottom end of where the Emmett's Canal stopped. And I'm presuming that that's the one that they're talking about. So he was playing up there with his mates, five year old, and he saw the plane come in above him. Now back in them days, they were used to seeing flying around, being in the wartime. Uh, but this one was very low. And he said, all of a sudden he saw it dip into the valley and circle round. And then he heard it crash at the bottom and then a, an almighty bang as it blew up. He remembers this and at the time this five-year-old boy who was called Bill Duncanson, he shot down to the crash site and he was mesmerized by what he saw. He said he saw this man in an RAF uniform crawling out of the wreckage and with it before you knew it the villagers will took him under their wings and in true Yorkshire style they took the injured man straight to the pub and I'm told it was this Savile Arms, which is in Hunsworth, just behind the camera on the other side of the hill over there. He took him there for a couple of swift pints to try to calm his nerves and maybe a few whiskies as well. But the five-year-old boy at the time, he wandered over there to see what was going on and quite a crowd had gathered outside the pub. And he, was, he remembers as a five-year-old boy peering through the window and looking at this man drinking those drinks dressed in his uniform. Now let's jump forward to 2003. This five-year-old boy, Bill Duncanson, had actually emigrated to Australia and he lived in Perth. Now this 20-year-old boy, Tom Scotland, who flew the plane, he was also Australian. And funnily enough, he lived near Perth in Australia. So many years later, Tom must have written an article in a local newspaper about the crash in Yorkshire. And at the time, Bill was living there and he saw this article and he looked at it and thought, that sounds like the one that I saw in Yorkshire. So, with that in mind, he contacted this guy, Tom. And out of the blue, Tom said, yes, that's the one I'm talking about. That was me. So, by a sheer coincidence, they were both living less than 10 miles apart for many years, and they didn't even know. So, the young boy that witnessed the crash, and the pilot that crashed the plane, or not crashed it, but that was in the crash plane, were living within 10 miles of each other, the other side of the world. Now a good end to the story is that the two met up and they used to reminisce about the uh, crash happening. And also they remained friends for many, many years after that until sadly Tom died in 2012. But they remained friends for a long time and every Boxing Day they used to meet up and have a whiskey together just to commemorate what happened all the way back in 1943. Now I thought that was a really good story now, when I say story, it is true. I'm not saying it like it's made up. It is true. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a wander around and I'm going to try show you some of the sites in the village where this happened. Now, because there's not much information about it, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where things happened, but I think I've got a good idea of where it was. But before we do that, I just want to take you over to the village green in Drub. Now, recently... A couple of years ago now, they put a memorial on the village green which talks about this story because there was no record of it anywhere in this village and a lot of the people living here didn't even know about it. So this remarkable story now has its own plaque. Now this plaque still survives today and it's over there in the on the village green. So I'm going to take you over there and just show you this plaque. So we're just making our way into the village green now. Just take you closer. So there you can see the plaque that was unveiled in 2013. Let's take you a bit closer so you can read that. If you want to read it in detail, just pause the video here. You'll be able to read what it says. It's basically telling the story of what I just told you.
Now it says on there that the crash happened 250 meters west of this plaque. So that would take it just down there in the field. And one can only imagine how the plane have actually crashed in the village and probably killed people. It may have been more than just a memorial there because I'm sure there would have been quite a few uh, tragedies there. So there may have been a bigger story to this village. But luckily, that didn't happen. And the village was safe because of the heroic act of the pilot, the 20 year old pilot, Tom. So I'm just making my way down the hill through the village of Drub. I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom of the hill, just where the plane is supposed to have come in and crashed through the wall and then made its way up the hill. So I'm currently stood at the side of the road on Whitehall Road, which is the A58. And uh, there's the road coming down the hill there. And Drub Village is just at the back up there on the top of the hill. So the plane would have come round here somewhere and circled in. And as it came into the field here, now I'm presuming these trees wouldn't have been here. So as the plane came down, there would have been a dry stone wall just over there. There's still one there today, but I don't know exactly where it hit it. It would have hit the wall there, and then its tail would have come off into the field just behind that wall. And the plane carried on that way and up the hill towards the village. So we're going to head down that public footpath there and see if we can follow the route. So the plane would have smashed its way through this wall here somewhere, discarded its tail just over here, and then made its way up the hill over there. Right about here, there's a brook just down there in the trees. If you read the crash report on the Tom Scotland book that he released, he mentions that he passed the brook in the plane, which is just down there. So he obviously skimmed across here at quite some speed, shot across the brook up there and then made his way up the hill. So we're just making our way over this uh, lovely little bridge. Here's the brook here, which runs right through the field here and onwards that way. <laughs> I've just spotted that down there. For a second, I thought it was part of an aircraft. I think it's just a, a lampshade of some kind. Now, it did say, straight after the crash happened, they uh, came out and they cleared the site very, very quickly. So within a couple of days, it was all gone. But there were some parts that were left over, hidden in the where it obviously hit the ground, there was bits buried in the ground. And years later, people were finding things and pulling them out and bits of uh, parts of the plane and bits of metal with rivets in. It's still found to this day. It's really hard to tell when you hear at which point the plane came in. Because like I said, it's quite a wide field, so it could have come in anywhere along this route here. I'm trying my best to work out if, well, look to see if there's any damage anywhere or any uh, anything like that. But I don't think there will be after all these years. I mean, this is heavy farmland now, so it's obviously been altered quite a lot. But during the uh, account of the crash from Tom, he mentions that when they came back to the site many years later, and I think this was in the 80s, he came back for a, a visit. And he met all the people, like 50 years later, he met all the people at the time that were present when the crash happened, including the young boy who asked if he could have the tail, who was now a 50 odd year old man. He met him and also a guy that looked after him and took him to the pub as well. And it must have been quite a nice little pilgrimage for Tom to come back and see it and the village that were so grateful for what he did after he saved many lives by doing what he did and being brave. So when he came back, apparently he took a walk through the crash site and he started over there where I did and headed this way through the field. And he says, just at the bottom of the hill from the field where he crashed, which is up there, he said there was a, a bush and a, a bit of a shrubbery at the bottom, which is this here, somewhere around here. And at the time, when the, when the plane crashed, he must have looked at the crash site and he said that the undercarriage, the wheels of the plane actually came off somewhere down here. So as it hit this ridge here, the wheels smashed off and the plane slid on its body up there, up the hill. And when he came through in the 80s, he found 
some metal with rivets in just in the hedge somewhere here and also a, like a mechanical arm from one of the wheels from the mechanism that lifted the wheels so there were still bits here buried in the mud or in the bushes and he happened to find that in the 80s so I bet if you were to dig around you might even find something today so I'm just making my way up through the field now I've got Drub Lane just to the side of me there through the trees this is the field in question so I've just walked up from down there and making my way up to the top of the hill now the account of the crash he says the plane rolled up the hill here and just as it got to the top I don't know if it stopped just before the trees or if he actually hit the trees and that's where he came to a stop that's pretty much where it would have been there are some houses just behind them trees so I've got to the top of the hill and I'm gonna hazard a guess this is where the plane stopped and crashed just at the top here just before the trees somewhere in the middle there you just see through there there is houses this side and it did say stop before the trees just at the back of the houses just a couple of meters more he would have gone into them houses luckily he didn't and he managed to get it into a quite a remote place here away from everything else and save everybody's lives so I'm going to say somewhere around here that the plane would have just exploded all the locals would have come rushing out including the young boy asking him if he could have the tail which would have been down there at the bottom now obviously this was many years ago now so you're not going to find anything uh, related within the ground so you're not going to find a big crater or anything like that like I said this is actual farmland now and it's still being used today so I doubt very much there'll be anything remaining in this field but I hope you enjoyed that little story there I thought it was really fascinating and I was trying to get more information even pictures or anything like that just to show you guys but unfortunately there isn't much about at all and um, what I found I'm going to put at the end of this video just a couple of pictures of Tom what a Halifax bomber looks like and any other pictures related to the story so I'll put them in at the end of this video, so stay tuned for those. Now if anybody has any further information, or anything that I've missed, or anything I got wrong, please do let me know in the comments below. Like I said, I'm only basing this off the research that I've done. And um, a few of it was guesses and guesswork, so if you know any different, or any better, please let me know in the comments below, or if you, even if you have a story to tell about it. Just let me know in the comments below. So I've just made my way back down the hill. I'm just about to head out. As you can see, I'm directly in line with where the crash would have happened. So I was up there a minute ago, and I'm directly in line with where it would have roughly come up and shed its wheels and everything, just down here in this hedge. Now, just while I'm here, I've just spotted something on the ground in the undergrowth down there. I don't know if you can see that. I'll get a bit closer for you. Could this be a part of the plane? It's like a piece of steel or iron or something, aluminium maybe, yeah. It's quite light and thin. And I think I can see a rivet hole just up here. It's buried down. It's actually like an L-shaped piece of metal. There's a little piece here. It's L-shaped and it goes down into the ground there. So I can't get it out. It's actually quite heavy and solid, but it's crumbling. Could that be part of the plane? He did say there was bits of wreckage strewn everywhere. And like I said, when uh, Tom came in the 80s, he found a piece or a few pieces of the undercarriage and the wheels just down here in the edge. So who knows? But anyway, I'm making my way out of the site now. I'm gonna head back to the car and get home and get a drink because it's absolutely boiling today. But thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed that little story there. But again, something different, which I like to do. I don't like to do just railways and canals all the time. I like to break it up a little bit. And I've got a few more interesting stories, a bit like this one, coming up in future, and a few different things as well. So again, if you've got any ideas for anything you want me to cover, 
just put down in the comments below. I'm open to ideas and I make notes of them as well. If it's an interesting story or if I can do enough research on it, I'll come out and film it. So thank you very much for joining us on this one. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you click the uh, circle logo just at the end of this video. But in the meantime, stick around for some pictures and I'll see you in the next video next week. Bye.